a nudge is something that can influence or modify the behavior of a people in a foreseeable manner without hindering their freedom to choosing or altering their economic benefits. For an entity to be considered a nudge, it must be suggestive instead of being imperative like an order. You should not view nudges as directives. You are nudging someone to eat healthy by putting a nutritionally beneficial snack at eye level while concealing the junk food. If you own a cafeteria and you arrange certain foods to look enticing and scrumptious, most people would choose those foods. You are nudging them to choose that option even though you do not utter a single word. You are not nudging anyone if you are directly ordering others to eat only healthy meals or forcing them to avoid junk food. People may comply in that moment, but don't expect them to always obey the things that you want them to do because it was not something that they have chosen to follow out of their own free will. Going back to the cafeteria scenario, the authors coined the strategy libertarian paternalism. It is considered libertarian because people are still free to do what they like and opt out of adverse arrangements. It is paternalistic because the options presented are beneficial to the choosers. Libertarian paternalism is somewhat weak and non-intrusive because people are free to do what they want, even if it is harmful to them. They can smoke packs of cigarettes and choose an unhealthy diet. However, libertarian paternalism has choice architectures designed for tracking or implementing anticipated choices that present options to push people towards a more beneficial lifestyle. They nudge. People who refuse paternalism often say that we can make terrific choices on our own, whether we have studied economics or not. Most economics textbooks depict an economic man as someone who thinks like a genius, keeps as much memory as a supercomputer, and possesses a willpower like Gandhi. Whether or not they have learned economics, a lot of people seem to embrace the idea regarding the economic man. But the sad reality is that the majority of people we know are not like that. Many struggle with mathematical calculations without a calculator and simply cannot easily adapt to problems like an economic man. Many of the nudges stated in this book have been implemented and brought immense benefits to those who complied. A nudge requires a well-designed choice architecture which involves arranging the perspectives on which people base their decisions. Consequently, retirement accounts, school cafeterias, alarm clocks, stairwells, and other things can be made more efficient to benefit health and well-being. Of course, no design can be modeled to perfection, which is why choice architects must carefully think of ways to have people make the right choice without coercion. Biases and Blunders in 1990, a psychologist and artist named Roger Shepard presented a drawing of two tables with the purpose of deceiving the onlookers. At one glance, most people would say that the table on the left is much narrower and longer than the table on the right. Try measuring the length and width of each table with a ruler and you will see that they have the exact same measurements. Try rotating the table on the right so that it matches the position of the other table. Remove their legs so you can get the tabletops and you will see the identical figures with the same size and shape. Though the human mind is truly amazing, it allows us to recognize people that we have not seen in a long time, learn multiple languages, and discover the theory of relativity. Even geniuses like Einstein would have fallen for the optical illusion above. Just because one of us failed to recognize the truth behind the tables does not mean there is something wrong with our brains. It means that everyone can improve his or her understanding of human behavior by recognizing how people can methodically make mistakes in perception. How we think. Two systems. Understanding how the human brain works is quite perplexing. Most people can perform a certain task without trouble, but can be completely ignorant at others. Beethoven was able to write his amazing Ninth Symphony despite being deaf, so would you be surprised if he found out that he often forgets where he put his house keys? The sad truth is that people can be so smart and so dumb practically at the same time. Neuroscientists and psychologists have been doing research to explain these contradictions. There are two systems that can help create a clear distinction between two kinds of thinking. The automatic system deals with unconscious and intuitive thinking, while the reflective system deals with conscious and rational thinking. The table below summarizes the key features for each system. With the automatic system, it is uncontrolled. The reflective system is controlled. 
The automatic system is effortless. The reflective system is effortful. The automatic system is associative. The reflective system is deductive. The automatic system is fast. Reflective system is slow. The automatic system is unconscious. The reflective system is self-aware. The automatic system is skilled. The reflective system is rule-following. The automatic system relies mainly on instinct and does not usually require you to think. When a ball is thrown in your direction, your initial reaction is to duck. People use their automatic systems when speaking in their native languages. On the other hand, the reflective system is more self-conscious and intentional. People use the reflective system when they are processing answers to questions and when learning another language. However, the more people process certain things with their reflective systems, these repetitive actions eventually become habit, which are then processed by their automatic systems. The authors were most likely using their reflective systems when writing this book, but they might have also used their automatic systems when ideas suddenly popped in their heads while doing something and not thinking about the book. Mr. Spock of Star Trek fame is a good example of someone with superb control over his reflective system. In contrast, Homer Simpson seems to do better using his automatic system because his reflective system is practically decommissioned. Rules of Thumb Most people are busy and lead complicated lives and therefore do not have the liberty to contemplate and analyze everything. People use rules of thumb because they are generally quick and useful. However, Using rules of thumb could also give way to systematic biases. Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky are two Israeli psychologists who identified three rules of thumb, anchoring, availability, and representativeness, as well as the biases associated with each. The two psychologists changed the way we view individual thinking so that economists have also adapted these rules of thumb. Anchoring Suppose someone asked you about a certain place, but you only know that it is the biggest city in the area. At the time, you know the population of a certain city that is three times bigger than that of the place being discussed. Based on the data you have, the first thing you might do is compare the two cities to determine the population of the one in question. If the bigger city has a population of three million, the other city should have a population of one million. However, that number will differ between people holding different sets of data. In this process, known as anchoring and adjustment, your anchor is the given scenario is the number that you know, to which you adjust your perception of the world. Typically, the adjustments are insufficient and result in bias. Anchors can influence how people think and act based on the facts that they know and must deduce. Anchors also serve as nudges. A fundraising campaign for charity may yield better results when donation options are 100, 250, 1,000, 5,000 compared to options of 50, 75, 100, and 150. Those who plan to donate the minimum amount given the first set of options would naturally choose $100 and would pick the minimum amount of $50 in the second set of options. Availability What should you do to prevent the possible dangers or challenges that may befall you every day? Most people use availability heuristics to answer such questions. They assess the probability of potential risks against real and theoretical examples of similar scenarios that have happened to themselves or to others. People often see a familiar danger as something more serious than one they have never experienced before. Your automatic system becomes keenly aware of the probability of risk, so that you do not need to confirm your wariness with statistics. The decision to purchase something like insurance could be influenced by experience, but a biased risk assessment can influence how you respond to the current situation. Representativeness Think of representativeness as a similarity heuristic. The idea is to judge the likelihood of entity A falling under category B. It is to prove that A is representative of B. For example, when people see a 6-foot, 8-inch African-American and a 5-foot, 6-inch Jewish male, most of them usually think that the former is a basketball player and the latter is not. This is not baseless deduction since there are currently many tall African-American basketball players and stereotypes can sometimes be accurate. Biases can still creep in when frequency and similarity are separated. The use of representativeness heuristics 
can lead to grave misperceptions. It is unfortunate that many cannot accurately perceive what arbitrary sequences look like. We often detect patterns from random processes and believe that the patterns hold great meaning. People often base their forecast or estimates using casual patterns that can change. Optimism and Overconfidence Each student in an MBA class was asked to fill out an anonymous survey regarding his or her class ranking with choices, the top 10%, the top 11 to 20%, and so on. Obviously, only 10% of the class actually belonged in the top 10%. However, the survey revealed that only 5% of students admitted they were below the median while a large percentage believed they were in the top 11 to 20 percent, which they did so out of modesty. If they were not restrained by modesty, many of them would have checked the top 10 percent instead. Most people believe that they are a lot better than they really are. They also believe that unfortunate things will never happen to them. Most people tend to have self-serving biases in which they ignore or reject their weaknesses and only see their strengths. Obviously, overestimating the capabilities can bring more harm than good. Gains and losses. People are much more sensitive towards losing something than gaining a priceless possession. Loss aversion produces inertia, which is a strong desire to keep the things that you currently have, even if it means incurring future losses. Those who fear losing what they have will most likely reject deals that could even profit them. Status quo bias. Inertia also occurs in status quo bias, when people want to preserve what they have, even if they do not benefit or grow. This heuristic can make people complacent and resistant to change, even if they know that they need to change. The lack of attention coupled with mindless choice only produces inefficient results. In this case, presenting default options can become powerful nudges. Framing. Framing makes a huge impact on how people process information. To some extent, People tend to be passive, make decisions mindlessly, and react differently to the information they receive. Take these statements as examples. 1. A doctor said that 90 out of 100 patients are still alive five years following heart surgery. Most patients immediately agreed to this operation. 2. A doctor said that 10 out of 100 patients are dead five years following a heart surgery. Most patients refuse to have the operation. The statements have the same meaning but are framed differently. For the first statement, people are given a positive statistic so that they believe the operation is worth the risk. However, for the second statement, people are given a negative statistic so that they believe the operation can result in death even though the mortality rate is the same as that of the first statement. Those thinking with the reflective system can discern that both statements have the same meaning. The goal of this chapter is to present a quick glimpse at human fallibility. Some people are too busy to analyze their choices, so instead they follow their automatic systems. The rules of thumb can be often misleading. The essential point is that people are nudgeable. The simple nudges can make a huge difference in their lives. Resisting Temptation Many years ago, one of the authors of this book held a small dinner party and put out a bowl of cashews that is usually only consumed with the first bottle of wine. However, he noticed that the cashews were disappearing quickly and was afraid that his guests would be too full to enjoy the food that had yet to be served. He quickly hid the bowl of cashews in the kitchen. The guests thanked him for his quick decision, proving that preferences could change, as the guests may have realized that they would have been too full to enjoy dinner had they continued to eat the cashews. When theoretically presented with options A, B, and C, Humans may not always prefer option A all throughout the day. For instance, they may prefer option A over option B in the morning, option B over option C in the afternoon, and option C over option A at night. The following day, their preferences may have changed. People may be tempted to choose a certain option, even though that choice may not be the best in general, but a hot-cold empathy gap made it difficult to exercise self-control. When people think in a calm, cold, rational way, they fail to realize the extent to which their conduct and desires are affected or distorted by arousal. This can only cause bad things to happen, especially when it comes with mindless choosing. Mindless choosing. Mindless choosing happens when people just eat anything that is available and easy to obtain. 
They base the amount of food they eat on the size of the food container, which can lead to an unfit and unhealthy body. Mindless choosing is not limited to food. People tend to choose the most convenient options at that time and never bother to consider the possible consequences that come with their decision. It is a temptation that is hard to resist, especially if one is pressed for time. Self-control strategies. People are at least partly aware that they have weaknesses that they need to conquer and will go as far as engaging outside support to help them, like an alarm clock to wake them up in the morning. A particular alarm clock called Clocky is quite effective in waking someone up. People usually hit the snooze button when the alarm goes off and sleep a little more, and sometimes they oversleep until they are already late for work. Clocky has wheels that enable it to roll out and hide while sounding the alarm so that users have to get up and chase it. People will most likely be fully awake by the time they manage to catch it. People try different strategies to avoid procrastinating by setting a kind of personal penalty system each time they fail to meet their own deadlines. Mental accounting. People treat money as non-fungible and keep some for rent, food, bills, and other expenditures. Dustin Hoffman used to keep his money in separate jars that were labeled based on their intended uses. Such practice prevented him from using money allocated for a specific purpose for spontaneous and unrelated purchases. His solution may not be considered the best, but it showed his strict self-control. He refused to use money for non-specific goals and instead found ways to produce the necessary funds like borrowing from friends. Following the Herd Your statements and action can easily influence others and vice versa. When you are watching a scene where people are smiling, you are likely to smile. It has been said that when two people live together for a long time, they begin to resemble each other by adapting the habits, expressions, mannerisms, nuances of the other, things that were previously unique to each of them. Doing what others do. Social influences have a powerful impact on the behavior and learning ability of an individual. Peer pressure is one of the things that can drive someone to follow what others are doing to avoid conflict. The power of social nudges should not be taken for granted. Consider the following research findings. 1. Teenage girls see other teenagers become pregnant and may end up in the same situation themselves, which may be why teenage pregnancy still happens to this day. 2. Obesity can be contagious. If your best friends who are always around you gradually get fat, you will most likely gain weight as well. 3. The study habits of college students can be influenced by their peers or the people with whom they often socialize. Focusing the behaviors and thoughts of others can lead to conformity effects. In the 1950s, a social psychologist named Solomon Ash conducted a series of conformity experiments. Participants were asked to make decisions on their own without relying on the judgments of others. Since the test was easy, most of the participants made no mistakes. However, when participants were allowed to consult each other, their errors significantly increased. As participants disregarded their own judgments and instead relied on the advice of strangers. The experiments were extended and replicated where 20 to 40 percent of participants erred in ridiculously easy tasks after seeing others make blatant mistakes. The spotlight effect. You may think that others are watching your every move, so you try your best to conform to social norms and fashions. People always show their best side. However, Studies show that people usually do not pay as much attention to the appearance or the presence of a stranger as expected. Culture change, political change, and unpredictability. Conformity also influences political and culture behavior. Experiments show that people do things like download a song after seeing that others have downloaded the same song, suggesting that popularity has compelling momentum. In many domains, people may be tempted to follow the the most popular public opinion or viewpoint of a singer, author, composer, or actor, regardless of the character and skills of that person. It is the same with political figures. Take caution, however. The outcome of social influence may or may not be orchestrated by a group, but it could lead to varied results. Social nudges as choice architecture. 
If they want to nudge a, a group of people, choice architects can simply disseminate information regarding the things in which these people are interested. Convincing advertisements that highlight the fact that most people go for brand X may drive many consumers to buy brand X. Public views regarding a particular product brand can be reshaped by the type of publicity associated with that brand rather than by the quality of the product. People are easily nudged by others because conformity is a part of human nature. When do we need a nudge? People can greatly benefit from nudges when faced with rare and difficult decisions, especially if it is impossible to get prompt feedback. If you were tasked to be the choice architect, what should be included to design an ideal choice environment? Various choices can be considered for nudges, which can influence one to choose investment grids, such as dieting, flossing, and exercising, over sin goods, such as excessive drinking, smoking, and eating sweets. Investment goods often come with immediate costs but delayed benefits, while sin goods provide immediate benefits and delayed costs. Both goods can help us find a fitting solution to difficult problems that are likely to be ignored or mishandled due to a lack of experience and confusion. For example, people may require more help in choosing a suitable mortgage deal than picking the right type of breakfast food. It is important to encourage feedback to help someone to learn from past experience. Difficult problems become easier to handle with practice. Even the best tennis player had difficulties serving the ball when he or she was learning how to play, but got better with disciplined practice. However, practice does not ensure that everything works out. The tennis player will have some days when everything does not go his or her way. Nudges can help a lot during those times when nothing seems to fall into the right place. Choice Architecture Choice architects, like designers, must incorporate human factors into their work. Take the case of Professor Thaler. Some of his students would try to sneak out of his class, but the only exit was the large double door in the front, which could only be opened by pushing the door. However, students would often pull the handle. Although everyone in the school was aware of this, most people would still keep pulling the handle after class. Yet, there was something wrong with the design of the door which illustrates the point that the signal or stimulus must be in harmony with the desired action. When there are inconsistencies, expect people to make mistakes. However, it is not always a fault in the system. Sometimes it is because the choice architect failed to create harmony or consistency between the stimulus and the desired action. Therefore, it is important for choice architects to develop or design choices that do not result in error-causing inconsistencies. Choice architects have the power to enhance our health, wealth, and happiness with the help of well-designed nudges such as incentives, understand mapping, defaults, give feedback, expect error, structure complex choices. Rational choice architects will give the right incentives to suitable people. There are four questions that can serve as a guide when analyzing the incentives of a specific choice architecture. Who choices? Who uses? Who profits? Who pays? Free markets can deal with all of these problems, but choosers may not be aware of the incentives they are given because these incentives may not be obvious. Consequently, choice architects must come up with more salient incentives. Many people will always choose the option that requires the least effort to obtain or has the path of least resistance. Go back to the previous discussions. And know that for a given choice, there is a default option, which can be selected if the chooser prefers to do nothing. Because of their tendency for immediate instant gratification or easy success, many may choose such an option, whether it is good or not. Defaults are powerful, ubiquitous, and unavoidable. In each node of the architectural system, there must be a rule that determines the effect on the decision maker who has decided to do nothing. It is true that by doing nothing, you can expect everything to remain the same, but that may not always be the case. There are also times when doing nothing can get you into trouble. Feedback is the best way to encourage people to perform better. Well-designed systems warn people when they commit errors and when they perform well. However, giving too much feedback is ineffective if people ignore the information being given to them. To err is human, and a well-designed system expects users to make mistakes 
so that a well-designed system provides some measure to remind users on what to do next. ATM machines usually have a feature that forces a user to retrieve his card before receiving cash, as most people forget to remove their cards without this feature. Automobiles have also become more user-friendly over the years. Warning signs remind the driver to stay safe while driving. A good system must be able to address possible errors that a person may commit and provide a warning to prevent or mitigate such blunders. People employ various decision-making strategies, such as considering the importance and intricacy of the presented options. When presented with a small number of alternatives, people tend to examine everything before deciding. When presented with different alternatives, people usually adopt simplifying strategies. Choice architects can help people simplify the available options so that they do not need to spend as much time examining the different alternatives. For instance, paint stores typically organize their products with color wheels. Moreover, a mail-order DVD rental company presents a helpful choice architecture by allowing customers to search for movies according to genre, directors, actors, ratings, and reviews. For commodities with non-transparent, complex pricing schemes, the authors recommend people to structure their choices using the Record, Evaluate, Compare, and Alternative Pricing, RECAP acronym. Save more tomorrow. The standard economic theory of saving money for retirement can only be described as simple and elegant. People typically calculate their earnings while currently employed and the amount they stand to get upon retirement. In general, people ensure that they have enough money for a comfortable retirement without sacrificing too much while they are still employed. Though this theory is an excellent guide to sensible saving, it faces two problems. First, it assumes that every person knows how to use complicated mathematics to help them determine how much they need to save. Second, it assumes that each individual has a sufficient willpower to carry out his or her plan. It is not easy deciding when to retire. The same goes for deciding when to begin claiming Social Security benefits. Social Security is a well-designed system that efficiently calculates the benefits that each member gets upon retirement. Members only need to decide when to retire and to start claiming their benefits. This is actually an ideal domain for nudging, so the authors put it, because the members need only to make one decision when they reach retirement age. Choice architecture can help them weigh everything and decide the most suitable day to retire and claim their benefits. Naive investing. It is quite difficult to determine the right amount to save, and it is even harder to come up with a suitable investment portfolio. As an investor, the first question you need to ask is how much risk you are willing to take. Stocks and bonds. High-risk investments such as stocks or equities can give higher rate returns than government bonds. However, bonds are safer than stocks. Choosing the right combination of stocks and bonds is known as the asset allocation decision. An investor can profit from risky investments without losing everything should these investments fail, as he or she owns government bonds. The investors need to weigh everything before making his or her final decision based on the investment portfolio desired. Courting your money while sitting at the table. In Chapter 1, we learned that people tend to not take risks to avoid losing what they have, even if they could gain much more than what they currently have. Investors can be categorized as impatient or patient investors. Since stocks fluctuate on a daily basis, impatient investors may not wish to invest in stocks because they want to profit immediately rather than waiting for stock values to rise. Conversely, patient investors usually choose their investments carefully and patiently wait for the appropriate time to sell their stocks. The authors recommended investors not to monitor stock portfolios daily, but rather on a regular weekly, monthly, or quarterly schedule. This allows for necessary adjustments. Market timing, buy high, sell low. During the 1990s, people were investing more of their retirement money on stocks than on any form of investment. What triggered such change in behavior? One possibility was that people learned that it was more profitable to invest in stocks than in bonds. The market timing ability of investors can be analyzed through their asset allocation decisions that can be found in their portfolios and see how it changed over time. The trouble with this approach is that most people do not change their portfolio because they need to complete a fresh set of forms. 
Another way to judge the way people think in terms of investment is to look at their portfolios and see how much money they have invested in stocks. Data shows that new investors tend to buy stocks when prices are high and sell stocks when prices are low. You can revisit Chapter 5 and create well-designed nudges. Markowitz's strategy, when in doubt, diversify, can be considered a diversification heuristic. It is not recommended for investors to put all their money into one investment. Diversification is a remarkable scheme, but there is a huge difference between naive investment and sensible diversification. Credit Markets Most Americans have more debt than savings. This is partially due to the natural tendency of humans to choose instant over delayed benefits, a proclivity that can be affected by their needs and circumstances. Taking out loans is an option for people to take care of themselves. However, when people borrow money, they may be harmed by some of their weaknesses, such as financial mismanagement. Governments should naturally respect the freedom of choice but they can also help their citizens by implementing nudges so people will not make bad decisions. Nowadays, mortgage shopping is more intricate than before, so it is quite difficult to match people with the appropriate mortgages. There are different types of loans that offer variable and fixed rates, along with miscellaneous fees, prepayments, penalties, and teaser rates. There are also subprime loans with higher interest rates, which poor and risky borrowers tend to choose. Shoppers are advised to compare loans and choose carefully before making a decision. Naive shoppers and shoppers who do not know about different loans and lenders are disadvantaged and can fall prey to predatory lenders. Ideally, lenders should submit a report which presents lending costs by interest rates and fees. All the various fees should be listed, ideally added to give a single sum total to give the borrowers important information regarding their payments when the teaser rate ends. Lenders may also provide this information to independent third parties like advisory groups that compare different lenders so that consumers can have a simple loan selection process. This lender comparison also makes the market more competitive. Privatizing Social Security, Smorgasbord Style During the 2000 presidential campaign, then-candidate George W. Bush stated his plan to designate a portion of payroll taxes for individual savings accounts. The plan did not get much attention during the early years of the Bush administration, but it notably resurfaced in 2005. While this issue was being deliberated in the U.S., Sweden was already launching a similar system. However, Swedish officials could have presented a better set of nudges and helped the citizens in choosing a better portfolio. There are important lessons that can be gathered from the Swedish experience. Design of the Swedish Privatization Plan If one could describe the Swedish plan in one word, that would be pro-choice, as plan offers many options and let people choose the most suitable one for them. However, the choice architect was not able to come up with a well-designed plan so that most people were unable to choose the best plan for them. You could say that these people were nudged in a different direction. Luckily, the U.S. government can learn from the weaknesses of the Swedish plan and come up with something that can benefit its citizens. The Default Fund The Default Fund presents two issues. One, what to include in the fund portfolio, and two, what status to designate the fund, i.e., encouraged or discouraged. Participants are given different options, including an option that only offers a default fund, hardly a nudge. The freedom of each participant is suppressed because he or she cannot decide what to include for each portfolio option. A good choice architect must be able to nudge participants to choose desired options without getting swayed by outside influences. Did active choosers make good choices? Is it safe to say that people would be better off choosing their own portfolio? Given that the financial circumstances of each participant was unknown, it was difficult to evaluate whether each person made a wise decision when picking his or her portfolio. Judging from the collected data, the active choosers failed. Advertising. Funds advertising raises consumer awareness about a product to help them make better and smarter choices. However, an ad campaign may turn out to be a happy dream or a nightmare. For instance, an ad campaign for a Swedish fund company featured Harrison Ford, known for his role in Star Wars and Indiana Jones. The ad stated that Harrison Ford can help consumers choose a better pension, 
but the campaign failed because it was unable to establish a connection between the famous characters that Harrison Ford had portrayed and the products that he endorsed. Doing badly without nudges. The worst feature of the Swedish plan was letting the participants decide their own portfolios. Given the complexity of portfolio selection, the government could have provided assistance. Since it is important to give and receive immediate feedback, nudges should have been designed into the plan. When people fail to receive prompt feedback, when they make a mistake, expect them to make even more mistakes. Prescription Drugs, Part D for Daunting One of the hot topics during the 2000 U.S. presidential campaign was prescription drug coverage. A classic government mandate was proposed by Gore, while George W. Bush pushed his campaign theme of compassionate conservatism. Bush offered an expensive new entitlement program to seniors who could choose whether to enroll and which plan to select among the available drug plans provided by private health care companies. After three years, the U.S. Congress passed the Bush coverage plan, also known as Part D. It was the largest overhaul in the history of Medicare. It was necessary to provide several plans so that consumers could choose the programs that best suited their needs. According to the Bush administration, a one-size-fits-all program was not consumer-friendly. The choices were carefully analyzed so that Part D satisfied the expectations of the planners. However, it suffered from a cumbersome choice architecture with four major defects. Part D had done a lot of good, but it could have been improved with a flawless choice architecture. Design of Medicare Part D Before Part D, American seniors relied on private and public plans for their prescription drug coverage. Part D gave the seniors that opportunity to choose their own plans and presented six key features. One key feature was that it was voluntary and that benefits could only be enjoyed once the senior was enrolled, save for those who were previously covered by Medicaid. However, some of the other features may have confused seniors. Confusion Awaiting Clarity Medicare Part D was passed to benefit seniors. However, eligible enrollees must choose from the 47 available prescription drug plans requiring seniors to look through each plan. Many experts believe that the program was good, but most seniors found it confusing. It was even spoofed in Saturday Night Live saying the program was a cinch for tech-savvy seniors who mastered their computers, satellite TVs, and iPods. President Bush was sympathetic, but also said that the program was worth it. A helpline to assist seniors with their inquiries was provided. Overall, seniors were satisfied, but there was still a need for further clarification. Random Default Plans for the Most Vulnerable Every person who failed to pick a plan was automatically assigned a random default plan. Those people who were considered the sickest and poorest enrollees were designated dual eligibles, who qualified for both Medicaid and Medicare and could switch plans at any time. However, those randomly assigned plans may not be suited to the needs of those vulnerable people. Perhaps due to inertia and status quo bias, most people stayed with a random plan even though they could have switched. Not user-friendly The Medicare website was created to help each senior choose a plan. Unfortunately, most seniors did not know how to use the Internet and found it troublesome relying on the website. The seniors who did know how to use the Internet were not web savvy. As a result, seniors relied on their adult children to navigate the site. To complicate matters, the site did not correct the spelling for mistyped drug names. Moreover, it was also too tricky to supply accurate information about drug dosage, as some prescription drug plans are constantly being updated. Consequently, Seniors did not always make good choices. Possible nudges that the program could have considered included the intelligent assignment of plans and the recap, record, evaluate, compare alternative pricing strategy. How to Increase Organ Donations The first successful organ transplant with a live donor was performed in 1954. Eight years later, the first transplant of kidney from a recently deceased donor was performed. The rest, as they say, is history. More than 360,000 organs have been transplanted since 1988, and nearly 80% of the donated organs came from deceased donors. Unfortunately, the demand for organs keeps increasing and has greatly exceeded the supply. More organs must be made available to save lives. Sadly, 
The main obstacle is getting the consent of a family member who are reluctant to donate. Nonetheless, there are some approaches that can be considered. Explicit consent. Most United States have the explicit consent rule, which means that donors must clearly show their willingness to donate their organs. Many people express their willingness to donate their organs, but only a few actually signed a donor card. Obviously, expressing willingness alone is not enough to be a donor. A signed donor card is a concrete piece of evidence and states that the donor is willing to give his or her organs to help extend someone in a critical need. To ensure that more organs are available and the wishes of the potential donors are not violated, the choice architecture must be modified or even overhauled. Routine Removal This is the most aggressive approach because the state owns the rights to the organs of those who have died or those with terminal conditions. The state has the right to remove the organs of the said person without securing permission from others. It may sound monstrous, but a widespread practice of routine organ removal can save countless lives. However, many people would surely object to a law that gives the government the power to take the body parts of its citizens without prior consent. Presumed consent. The good thing about presumed consent is that unlike explicit consent, the freedom of choice of each participant is preserved. Under this policy, everyone is presumed to be willing donors by default. However, people can opt out of donating by registering their unwillingness. In an online survey, participants who recently moved states were asked in different ways regarding their willingness to be an organ donor. Participant responses were entered with one click. The survey that presented explicit consent conditions said that no one should be an organ donor. Participants were given a chance to confirm or change the default status. The survey that presented presumed consent conditions said that everyone should be an organ donor. Participants were also given a chance to confirm or change the status. The third survey presented a neutral condition where no default status had been given and the participants had to decide whether to be an organ donor or not. When participants had to opt in to being a donor, 42% complied. When participants had to opt out, 82% agreed to donate their organs. Almost 79% of the participants agreed to donate their organs in the neutral condition. It is clear that the default status matters. Saving the Planet Governments all over the world have been trying their best to protect the environment by implementing different means to lessen pollution and improve human health. Unfortunately, many regulatory efforts proved to be wasteful and costly, and some of them even made matters worse. In recent years, governments have shifted their focus to global environmental problems, including the sorry state of the ozone layer. Through international agreements, ozone-depleting chemicals have been banned. However, effective international controls have yet to be implemented to mitigate climate change, an issue that concerns people around the world. Can improved choice architecture and nudges help reduce greenhouse gases? It definitely can. However, governments have gone beyond nudging in their attempt to protect the environment and their constituents. As regulators preferred command and control regulation over designing an effective choice architecture, rather than nudging people to do what is right to protect themselves and the environment, which seems ineffective, governments have decided to impose rules and regulations. Better incentives. To help the environment, two broad approaches have been proposed. One, penalize or tax polluters, and two, implement a cap-and-trade system where polluters are allowed to pollute in exchange for a certain amount. Most specialists believe that these incentivized approaches are more effective and efficient than command and control regulations. People feel better knowing that they can do what they want by paying a certain amount than if they were to be forced to follow rules. They have the freedom not to do something if they think that the price they need to pay is too much. The choice architecture must present choices that makes the choosers prefer something they would give them an economic advantage. Feedback Information it is important to divulge information that informs people how pollution-causing agents and practices can harm the environment and other humans. Information is sometimes a strong motivator. People tend to fear nothing when they are unaware of the danger that a certain decision, act, or substance can bring. At first, no one knew how dangerous smoking was. Today, people are aware of the harm it does to the body, 
all thanks to the information that has been disseminated. Although there are still a lot of people who smoke, that number has significantly decreased as information about the effects of smoking is increasingly circulated. Offering incentives such as the ones presented earlier do not restrict the freedom of the choosers and gives them the confidence to decide what is best. Due to some economic constraints, most choosers would likely decide not to further pollute the world. The choices also allow people to think about what is best for themselves and the environment. Designing effective choice architecture may require careful planning to create choices that people cannot resist choosing while at the same time making them abandon the idea of polluting the environment. Improving School Choices President Franklin D. Roosevelt advocated the right to quality education in 1944. Milton Freeman argued that the best way to improve the quality of education in schools is to establish interscholastic competition. If schools compete, the most disadvantaged kids would benefit the most since wealthy families can afford to send their children to the pricier private schools. If vouchers were given to subsidize schooling for poor and rich children alike, the poor children would have the same education opportunities as middle and upper class children. Conversely, critics were worried that public schools with large student populations may be unable to provide the quality of education required due to financial constraints. Moreover, critics worry that vouchers will only help rich parents to send their kids to private fancy schools, while public schools would be for private schools rejects and everyone else. Competition can make institutions do their best to attract more patrons, but having a lot of available options can sometimes bring more harm than good. When it comes to schools, it is good to have competition. Experiments about choice programs were conducted and results showed that although competition was not the best solution, it helped to improve student performance in many schools. Since parents are generally the ones who choose schools on behalf of their children, they must be nudged to choose the most suitable option for their children instead of settling for inconvenience, like the nearest school. Complex Choices and Mental Shortcuts Officials of Worcester, Massachusetts, were probably to blame for the failed implementation of the No Child Left Behind law in their area. There may have been miscommunication when officials were explaining the said law to local parents as parents became reluctant to exercise their right to choose. Of the hundreds of thousands of Worcester students, two students benefited from supplemental services while only one student switched schools. Most parents did not exercise their right to transfer their children to another school because they had to complete many requirements like meeting the principal and attending meetings. Due to financial difficulties, low-income parents usually chose schools that were near their homes and those that simplified the process to transfer their children. However, nudge can have a strong influence in encouraging better school choices. In an experiment conducted in Charlotte, Parents were given an abbreviated fact sheet about the different schools that was written according to the recap strategy. As a result, most parents chose better schools for their children, regardless of distance. Nudging High Schoolers Toward College The school superintendent in San Marcos, Texas, and a nearby Austin Community College administrator came up with a nudge that can encourage high schoolers to go to college and improve their career choices in life. This nudge went like this. If students wanted to graduate from San Marcos High, they needed to fill out an application to the nearby Austin Community College. This effective nudge was not fabricated since eligible ACC applicants only need to earn a high school diploma and show proof that he or she has taken a standardized test. High school students are practically accepted into the community college when they submitted an application. Should patients be forced to buy lottery tickets? Every election cycle, the candidate always includes a better health plan for the masses as part of their election campaign. Whatever the outcome might be in the long run, the fact remains that it is hard to design a health plan that would be able to satisfy everyone as it would be outrageously expensive to do so. Health care can be made affordable if each person can maintain a healthy lifestyle and be content with a health care plan according to his or her needs. A person can save more money by getting regular checkups, and by choosing the most suitable insurance plan. However, every American health care beneficiary is forced to pay extra for the right to sue their doctors for malpractice. Experts believe that doctors and patients should be free to draft their own agreements 
regarding that particular right. If the patients prefer to waive that right, they should be allowed to do so. If plan holders are given the freedom to waive that right, he or she will be able to pay a lower premium. Besides, filing a lawsuit costs a lot of money, effort, and resources, and it may take time to prove that malpractice did occur. There is insufficient evidence that doctors perform better when patients have the right to file for medical malpractice. In most cases, patients who were grievously harmed by medical malpractice were not able to get the compensation they deserved, while those who were compensated from unsuccessful lawsuits were not greatly harmed at all. Not all of that compensation goes to the patient. The lawyer gets 40% if the case is won. It is the same as saying that playing in the lottery can be exciting and fun, but should citizens be forced to buy lottery tickets? Choice architects must determine the components of the system that can benefit all parties involved and acknowledge that many people would be better off if they were given the liberty to waive certain rights. The authors believe that negligence liabilities brings more harm than good for most people. Those who decide to file a case and lose should shoulder the lawyer fees. However, those who decide not to sue will still have to pay the premiums that grant the right to file a lawsuit. Privatizing marriage. Questions about marriage and same-sex relationships have been raised. Many religious groups oppose same-sex marriage, arguing that they have the right to officiate unions that are acceptable to them with regards to aspects like age, religion, and gender. To respect the views of religious organizations and protect the general freedom of each person, the authors propose the privatization of marriage. Under the proposal, the word marriage would cease to exist in any laws and branches of government and that marriage licenses would no longer be offered and recognized. The state government should negotiate with its local religious groups on the issue of marriage. Under this said approach, the state should recognize a civil union as a domestic partnership agreement between two individuals regardless of their gender and orientation. Marriages should thus be regarded as a private matter that religious or private organizations can regulate under their own sets of rules. A church or a scuba diving club can announce that it will only marry its own members. Couples will be allowed to choose the organization that will marry them. The law treats marriage as an official status that is accompanied by government mandates and entitlements. Married couples receive economic and non-economic benefits like tax benefits, entitlements, inheritance, and other death benefits, surrogate decision-making, ownership benefits, and evidentiary privileges. The said benefits are only applicable to married couples whose marriage was granted by the state. A marriage can be considered legally invalid if a couple was married by a religious or private institution without validation by the state. That couple would not be able to enjoy the benefits given to legally married couples. Many believe that the official licensing system is outdated and that the state-run marriage is discriminatory. Also, a child conceived from unmarried parents is considered illegitimate. That child may not receive the same benefits as a legitimate child born to legally married parents. Choice architecture should present nudges that help people realize their obligations and rights and safeguard vulnerable individuals like children and women in most cases. A dozen nudges. Here are some mini nudges for you to consider. 1. Consider the Give More Tomorrow program, basically the same with Save Me Tomorrow, except that people are asked to donate to their favorite charities while ideally increasing their donations every year. 2. Think about the charity debit card and tax deductions. The bank issues the charity debit card and only charities are eligible to accept the donations. The amount will be deducted from your bank account and the bank will issue a statement that lists all donations made during the year. The statement can be sent directly to the IRS, which then processes the appropriate tax deductions. 3. By imposing an automatic tax return, both ordinary citizens and the IRS will benefit from faster and simpler tax preparation and processing. Since many people doubt the IRS, it could try to regain the trust of the people by reimbursing taxpayers via tax bonuses. 4. Shtick.com can help a person make commitments and accomplish his or her goals. 5. Quit smoking without using a nicotine patch. 6. When a state wants motorcyclists to wear a helmet without mandating it by law, local officials can pass an ordinance requiring a rider to get a special license 
not to wear a helmet. The rider must also take extra driving courses and present proof of health insurance. 7. Plan and implement effective personal controls on gambling. 8. Follow the examples of Destiny Health Plan where members are encouraged to stay healthy and fit with incentives such as Vitality Bucks that can be used to buy magazine subscriptions, airplane tickets, electronics, and hotel stays. 9. Implement a dollar a day program to prevent future teen pregnancies. Teenage girls will have already given birth to one child are given a dollar for each day that they are not pregnant. 10. Installing red lights that serve as warnings to change air conditioner filters can nudge a person to act immediately. The same can be applied to other appliances and reminders. 11. Take advantage of no bite nail polish and desulfurum to stop certain bad habits. Those who always bite their nails can use bitter nail polish. On the other hand, alcoholics wishing to stop drinking can take desulfurum, which results in unpleasant drinking experiences. 12. Use software programs that perform civility checks and warn users when they are about to send an uncivil email. Objections. Would anyone oppose nudges? They might object if the propaganda machine of the government quickly shifts from an information drive to direct manipulation to ban and coercion. To avoid objections, one must take the following points into consideration. Each proposal must progress towards improving the lives of other people. Everyone must have the freedom to choose. People must not feel that they are being pushed or forced to agree on certain matters. In some cases, it is pointless to expect authorities to stand aside. Choice architects, public or private, must be able to come up with alternatives that work around all parties. Evil nudgers and bad nudges. Nudges can have good and bad intentions. In presenting nudges that may seem helpful, choice architects may actually have their own ulterior motives. When a certain company gives customers a discounted rate for initial enrollment but automatically re-enrolls them under a higher rate the following month, its primary aim is not to save customers the trouble of signing up again. Understand that real architects can also develop conflicts of interest. Choice architects may favor a default rule that benefits their economic interest or the interest of the organizations in which they work. Should we worry about choice architects? Are private choice architects more reliable than public choice architects? It is incorrect to say that public choice architects are less trustworthy than private choice architects. In any case, Public sector managers must address the need of the constituency, while private sector managers must focus on increasing profit and share prices. The invisible hand that controls choice architects can appear at any given time. Rules of engagement to reduce illegal acts must be created to promote healthy competition. Keep special interest groups at bay and present incentives that prioritize public interest. Plan designers must be more informed. A strong measure to safeguard against malicious plans must be created. The right to be wrong. In a free society, skeptics may argue that we have the right to be wrong, which can be helpful because we can learn from our mistakes. However, at times it is better to implement simple reminders than inform people on the possible risks of certain things. Should vehicles intentionally hit pedestrians just to teach others to look before crossing? A reminder on the sidewalk to check traffic conditions can prevent personal harm. Of punishment, redistribution, and choice. Most of the time, it helps to nudge people who need help. If people are already saving money for retirement, encouraging them to enroll in the Save More Tomorrow program would not have any effect. Similarly, promoting those who are already improving their lives to join self-employment campaigns is not much of a stretch. The most strident libertarians are mainly concerned with freedom of choice and personal liberty and are not very interested in welfare. At most, they would divulge all the necessary information so that the people can make their own life choices without nudges. Nudges are often unavoidable, but making an active choice is sometimes the right route to take. Drawing Lines and the Publicity Principle When one of the authors took his daughter to the three-day rock festival called Lollapalooza, he saw a huge electronic board that displayed messages like, Drink more water, and 
You sweat in the heat, you lose water. What was the intention of the organizers? At the time, the area was struck with a terrible heat wave, so the messages were nudging people to drink more water. The phrase more water was far more effective than drink enough water or drink water. The phrase lose water was telling people that the heat would make them lose water, implying that they needed to rehydrate. Sublimable advertisements that can subconsciously influence the decision of the viewers. Lines such as, aren't you thirsty, or drugs kill, can make people think about the issues addressed by those advertisements. Neutrality. Neutrality is sometimes both important and feasible. With respect to ballot design, it is best to keep things neutral to avoid bias in support of certain candidates and in opposition to others. In this case, choice architects need to construct choices or nudges that are impartial and objective. Why stop at libertarian paternalism? Many believe that liberal paternalism and nudging is too cautious and modest. If the objective is to protect people, why not venture further? Libertarian paternalism is closely associated with asymmetric paternalism. Consider the sun lamp as a simple example of asymmetric paternalism. Sun lamp user typically uses it for a certain duration. It is not advised to use the sun lamp for too long because it can burn your skin and increases the risk of acquiring skin cancer. Since people need to lie down when using the sun lamp, most often tend to fall asleep. To prevent the user from dozing off for too long and burning the skin, the sun lamp is designed with a built in timer and alarm that automatically turns off the lamp. Should the government require sunlamp manufacturers to include this safety feature? The answer depends on the result of cost-benefit analysis. If the timer does not cost too much and the risk of getting burnt is high, then the government may require it. Asymmetric paternalists also endorse cooling off periods to prevent anyone from acting harshly at the spur of the moment and regret everything later. The Real Third Way This book makes two claims. One, seemingly small aspects of social situations can have great impacts on human behavior. Nudges, whether created by good or bad choice architects, are all around us even if we do not notice them. Two, libertarian paternalism is not a perfect example of an oxymoron, although it can be seen as such. Choice architects can design something that allows people to exercise their right to choice while nudging them to the path that will improve their lives. The authors are hopeful that libertarian paternalism will be able to offer a real third way that can address some of the more intractable disputes of our time. Many sensible Democrats know that mandates can be counterproductive and ineffective in that one size may not fit all, as society is simply too diverse and creative circumstances tend to change quickly and the government is imperfect. Officials can nudge people to take the path that can help them improve their lives. There should still be freedom of choice, and a little nudge can help a lot. Bonus chapter, 20 more nudges. There are nudges that can help us save the environment and conserve energy. One, making electronics or jewelry pieces that are color-coded according to their carbon footprints. Two, using smart meters that allow households to set cooling and heating programs throughout the day. Three, comparing energy use among neighbors. 4. Installing an inexpensive home energy meter that displays energy usage or the amount of money being spent. 5. Providing driver feedback to combat global warming. 6. Using power-aware cords. 7. Providing carbon labels. 8. Implementing make-believe speed bumps. 9. Eliminating dividing lines on the road to achieve psychological traffic calming or showing drivers a smile. 10. Counting calories in New York City. 11. Patronizing trailless cafeterias to prevent wasting food. 12. Checking waistlines to prevent obesity. 13. Setting reminders to take prescription drugs. 14. Downloading a procrastinator clock for the computer. 15. Reminding people to stop blabbering. 16. Making airline seat pockets from a clear material. 17. Replacing panhandlers with parking meters. 18. Running limousine services for would-be drunk drivers. 19. Informing everyone on the need to recycle. 20. 
designating target zones in urinals. Nudges are everywhere, even though they may be seemingly hidden and imperceptible. A simple message, reminder, or warning can nudge someone to improve, be safe and healthy, or buy something. Sometimes it is necessary to evaluate people and things from different perspectives. By approaching life from only one viewpoint, people may look for solutions in different places and fail to see that the answer is right in front of their face. This book discusses the biases and blunders that most people commit to find the answer to a problem. Readers are advised to tackle it from different angles to discover a fitting solution. Resisting temptations is difficult, but not impossible. Following the herd may not always be a good choice. There are times when one can find a better solution by following a different path. Readers are urged to think about the future and take advantage of current opportunities like making wise investments and decisions. This book has tackled subjects like sociology and economics, money, health, freedom, objections, and other nudges. Nudges can greatly impact many people. Depending on the situation, some nudges are subtle, while others are blatantly obvious. Choice architects must design choices that can benefit most people. However, even choice architects can be tempted by personal interest so that the architects themselves need a little nudging to work for the betterment of many people of society instead of a select few. Governments are encouraged to see the immediate needs of their citizens and come up with effective solutions. Like individuals, they too need to resolve the most pressing problems from different viewpoints. In fact, the solutions to these problems and issues may not always be as complex as expected. The book has presented different scenarios and circumstances where nudges are more helpful than they seem. You may not always need a nudge, but they are always there when you need them the most. You just need to look around and see.